Greetings, everyone. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Blessed Michael McGivney Pilgrimage Center and another of our monthly uh, series of lectures on the Eucharist, the Holy Eucharist, as we approach the Eucharistic, Revi Eucharistic Revival, which was established by the bishops of the United States. You know that we will have a Eucharistic pilgrimage that precedes the Eucharistic Congress. It begins here next May on Pentecost Sunday. And Jesus will be walking in the Blessed Sacrament in procession from here all the way to Indianapolis. It's a, a very exciting time for our nation. And so we've been having these series of talks, and I'm really excited that Father Pierre Toussaint is with us today. Father Pierre Toussaint is a Freeport, Long Island native, and he is a member of the community of the Friars of the Renewal having entered in 2008. He was ordained to the priesthood in 2018. Father P.T., as he is uh, often known, graduated from Kellenberg Memorial High School on Long Island and Ave Maria University in Florida. And uh, he is in the Bronx. It's, he is a, a local superior with the friars in the Bronx. And what's very uh, interesting to me is that he is, his name in religious life he took after Venerable Pierre Toussaint. Uh, some of you may know that Pierre Toussaint was a Haitian immigrant to New York, and his cause for canonization is open. He left an enduring example of Christian charity and evangelization. He was a former slave, and here in New York he was a, a barber, a hairdresser, um, and he had just a, a profound witness, um, and that's what led to his cause. His cause was introduced in the 1960s, and he is actually entombed, a layman. He is entombed under the sanctuary at St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York City. So Father P.T.'s life as a, a Franciscan friar is really in imitation of the Poverello, St. Francis of Assisi. And what's unique is that this year, we are observing the 800th anniversary of St. Francis's drawing people together in a small village of Greccio in Italy for the representation of the biblical narrative of the Nativity. It was a living creche, if you will, with people playing the parts of the Holy Family and the shepherds and the animals in the cave. That was 800 years ago in 1223. And what we celebrate today in our churches and our homes is very much an imitation of what St. Francis did 800 years ago. So he had great admiration for Jesus incarnate. And he has instilled that in all of his friars, as I'm sure Father will share with us today. And obviously, if we didn't have Jesus incarnate, we wouldn't have Jesus in the Eucharist. So for more, would you please join me in welcoming Father Pierre Toussaint. Good afternoon. It's a joy being here and a, and a, and a privilege, um, truly. And, uh, and once again, thank you, Mr. Sonsky, Peter, for, uh, for the invitation. And it's, it's just a privilege, once again, just to be able to speak about this 800th anniversary of the Christmas scene in Greccio that Francis so popularized. And it's beautiful because it just draws me back to memories, specifically as friars. We, we try to do that every year with the people we, we live with and the people that we minister to. And so I'm a Franciscan friar of the Renewal, and our community was started in 1987 by Father Benedict Rochelle and other instigators, as he calls them, other founders. And uh, our community is noted for just working with the poor and living in those neighborhoods. And so every year we try to have what we call a live nativity, where much like Francis, we have live animals that come, and uh, we invite the people from the neighborhood to come and just to reimagine and to, to re-wonder, if you will, that mystery of Christmas, of Christ coming down incarnate in, in flesh and blood to us. And so one year I was the, the MC, the main coordinator of this, and um, I was trying to just to get support or maybe just to get the crowd going. And so there was kids in the front and the families are gathered there. There's animals and we have the, the manger scene there. And so trying to excite the kids, I said, all right, kids, tell me what's Christmas about? And then one kid in the front screams out, it's all about the money. <laughs> <laughs> and quietly, uh, I'm assuming his father's hand came and like smacked him in the back of the head. <laughs> 
but it was just a, a funny, funny experience where we all just need um, just reimagining once again, or our hearts need to be recentered in this mystery of Christmas and this mystery of Christ coming to us in flesh and blood. And St. Francis was this, this man, this little person, if you will, a Pavarello, who was fascinated by Christ. Um, he was fascinated by Christ. And he was a passionate man, a man who, who loved dearly. And of course, he was passionate. He was Italian, right? And so his heart was always inflamed with these bigger things. Um, at one point in his life, he was passionate for the world. But then he became Christ-centered. Another point of his life, he was a renowned young man, um, and he wanted to kind of make a name for himself as a knight. And then he desired to be just a brother amongst brothers. And that passion is what led him to places that even he didn't even dream of. Um, in speaking about himself in the Testament, he says, the Lord gave me, Brother Francis, to begin doing penance in the following way. When I was in sin, it seemed much too bitter for me to see lepers, but the Lord himself led me among them and I showed them mercy. And when I returned from them, that which to me had seemed bitter was changed for me into sweetness of soul and body. After that, I lingered briefly and I left the world. St. Francis truly was a man who was in this world but was not of this world. He allowed Christ to be the one to move him to places and to heights once again, unimagined on his part, but even more so, he was moved by his own poverty and the poverty of others. And I think the proper lens or the proper way in which we should look at St. Francis and just even to this whole Christmas mystery is, is poverty. And as once again, as mentioned, as far as we embrace, as St. Francis did, this gift of total dependence on the Lord, on God the Father, through the Son and the Holy Spirit. And we have an opportunity as friars just to, to come in contact with, with his poor, um, Christ's poor, but with the poverty in ourselves. We have one man in our neighborhood um, named John. And during the pandemic, uh, a lot of our, our life was shut down as far as ministry, um, just due to the coronavirus. And so what we tried to do was we had holy hours in our, what well, we have a, a use of a gymnasium. We spaced the seats out and we were conscious at this point, it was right when everything started, of, of keeping social distancing and, and um, making sure things were, were sanitary for, for people to, to worship. And Walter, our resident, I'm sorry, John, our resident, um, just guy in the neighborhood came over and he just passed all the different boundaries. <laughs> he was unconcerned with them. And it was beautiful to see he was um, just praying in front of the Blessed Sacrament. And John's not even Catholic, uh, but John was just there sitting, sitting in a seat um, and he pulled it very close to the Blessed Sacrament and was just looking and laughing and speaking out loud. Of course, to the brothers, this was kind of not annoying, but hey, hey, this is Blessed Sacrament time or our, our private time before the Blessed Sacrament. So be a little bit quieter. Um, but there was a beautiful movement of, of once again, John and his poverty just coming before the Lord and experiencing the peace. And it's our joy and our opportunity as friars to be able to experience that both in our own prayer, but also to witnessing others around us who once again, maybe as less fortunate as us, um, are able to experience Christ in this way. Francis had a very special love of God, uh, says an author and what we may call the mysteries of divine humility. He was deeply attached to the infant Jesus, to the crucified Christ, and to the blessed Eucharist. There is nothing that shows more graphically the humility, the poverty, which the divine word accepted in becoming incarnate, than the helplessness of infancy, the defenselessness of the crucifixion, and the silence of the Eucharist. So for, Pr for Francis, poverty, once again, was this way in which he encountered the Lord. He encountered Christ in everything. It was really through the poverty, once again, of the infant in the creche, of the crucified Christ and the Eucharist, that he saw everything. And if you will, this will be the, the kind of schema of, of the presentation today. And Francis and the Eucharist. Francis was a man who, who loved the Eucharist. Um, he was deeply, deeply in love with Jesus. And in, a, in the admonitions, basically these, these sayings that he gave to the order and to faithful around him, the first one is on the Blessed Sacrament. And he says, let everyone be struck with fear. Let the whole world tremble and let the heavens exult when Christ, the Son of the living God, is present on the altar in the hands of a priest. O wonderful loftiness and stupendous dignity. O sublime humility. 
O humble sublimity, that the Lord of the universe, God and the Son of God, so humbles himself for our salvation, he hides himself under an ordinary piece of bread. Brothers, look at the humility of God and pour out your heart before him. Humble yourselves that you may be exalted by him. Hold back nothing for yourselves of yourselves, that he who gives himself totally to you may receive you totally. And so for Francis, this was the way in which he encountered the Eucharist. This is the way in which he saw Jesus. It's interesting, he never refers to Jesus as the Eucharist. He always refers to, to Jesus as the flesh and blood. It's never just the Eucharist, which could seem somewhat foreign, but the flesh and blood of Christ. Once again, the incarnate Christ. And for Francis, this is what informed everything that he did. Um, continuing on, he says, to, he says to the order, Whereof children, how long will you be hard of heart? Why do you not know the truth and believe in the Son of God? Behold, each day he humbles himself, as when he came from the royal throne into the virgin's womb. Each day he himself comes to us, appearing humbly. Each day he comes down from the bosom of the Father upon the altar in the hands of a priest. And as he showed himself to the holy apostles in the true flesh, so, so he shows himself to us now in sacred bread. And as they saw only his flesh by looking with their flesh, but believed him to be God, contemplating with spiritual eyes, let us, seeing bread and wine with bodily eyes, see and firmly believe them to be his most holy body and blood, living and true. And in this way, the Lord is always with his faithful, as he himself said, Behold, I am with you until the end of the age. This is what brought Francis to soar contemplatively. This is the place in which Francis lived, once again, knowing the Eucharist as the flesh and blood of Christ, and experiencing it in his own poverty, knowing that he could come before the Lord. And this is the logical path that, that Francis um, took, that everything now in creation spoke to him of the beauty of Christ, that everything became this incarnate um, image of Christ, where he's able to see in the, the brother birds and the sister and sister moon, just an image of Christ. Um, and it's so much more than just him being an animal lover, but it's more so of him encountering Christ in these things. And the beautiful thing is that everything that he saw in creation with his contemplative heart spoke of Christ. Um, and it's a beautiful thing because we have this ability, once again, to be moved by Christ, to see beauty in creation, but even more so just to encounter him in his flesh and blood. Um, also during the pandemic, we, we have a homeless shelter. We were able to, to once again, just minister to the men in the neighborhood. And, uh, and during this time, it was, once again, a confusing time. And so the missionaries themselves, they had holy hours throughout the days. And one of the men snuck into the missionaries' holy hours, um, one of our guests at the shelter, Andres. And uh, the missionary said, hey, Andres, the time for your prayer is a little bit later, so just please leave us um, to have our time of prayer. And so long story short, Andres, not satisfied, not being able to pray, um, he goes outside and he just looks up at the Blessed Sacrament from the, the courtyard there. And it's a beautiful image because one day I just walked past Andres and he was just looking up and I said, hey, hey what are you doing? And he says, well, I'm just praying to Jesus because I know at this time he's exposed in the Blessed Sacrament. And it's just a beautiful image once again where, where Andres in his poverty um, just knew the place to go. He would often talk to me about the Father of Mercies. The Father of Mercies always speaks to me, especially in these difficult places that I am. And Andres knew the place where his poverty could be met with Christ's beauty, where his poverty could be met with, once again, the poor one. And this is much the same way in which St. Francis lived his life. And this is much in the same way in St. Francis was once again brought to the heights of contemplation, so that way he was transformed, so that not just he that saw Christ, but Christ that saw him, and he was able to, if you will, be Christ to those around him. And secondly, of course, the poverty of the Eucharist is preceded by the gift of the infant child in the stable. And so, as Mr. Sonsky just, just uh, illuminated for us, the, back in Greccio in December, 20, December 1223, um, St. Francis had the inspiration to recreate the infant uh, child's birth. And St. Francis was a man who loved and, and desired to live the gospel. 
as an aside, he had written a rule and the rule was basically just the gospel. And he brought it to Rome and the Pope said, hey, you have to have something other than just the gospel in your rule. <laughs> That's how much St. Francis desired to live out the gospel. And so he went back and they, they, re, uh, they refigured the, the rule of St. Francis um, so that way it was more acceptable. But, but this is the fire that St. Francis has specifically of living out the gospel. And he wanted to, once again, incarnate the gospel. And so this was very much on his heart to, to make this presentation of the birth of Jesus um, so that way people can actually experience it. And so he asks a friend of his, John, about 15 days before, if he can get together an ox and an ass so that way they're able to have this uh, representation of the birth of Christ. And it says here in a life, in, um, in a story about his life, he says, hurry up, hurry before me and carefully make the things ready, I tell you. For I wish to enact the memory of the babe who was born in Bethlehem, to see as much as is possible with my own bodily eyes, the discomfort of his infant needs, how he lay in a manger, and how with an ox and an ass standing by, he rested on hay. And so once again, for Francis, it wasn't so much about the idea about things, but it was actually just seeing Christ in this way, by experiencing Christ in this way, by once again, as he mentions, the Eucharist, his flesh and blood. Um, it's very tangible, it's very real, it's incarnate. And Francis desired uh, to once again have this happen for the people around him. And it's beautiful because it's the poverty of Christ that moved him. It says about this, this time, Indeed, the manger is prepared, the hay is carried in, and the ox and the ass are led to the spot. There, simplicity is given a place of honor, poverty is exalted, humility is commended, and out of Greccio is made a new Bethlehem. And this is what Francis desired. Um, once again, that poverty was exalted. And poverty was exalted not just by him making this, this new scene at Greccio, but poverty was exalted back in Bethlehem when Jesus came. When Jesus came for love of us, so that way we can experience once again the goodness of the Father in the Holy Spirit. And on this evening, Francis preached. He read the gospel. He was a deacon. And so he had the opportunity and the gift of reading the gospel to the people. And it says, as he was preaching the gospel, he seemed to lick his lips any time he remembered or said the name of Jesus. Once again, for Francis, it wasn't just about um, this person who's far away from me, but even as he says the name of Jesus, it's present to him, as if it's, it's sweet to his taste. And for, Fran for Francis, um, this idea of Christmas, or even more so this remembrance of Christmas, was culminated in the Eucharist. And so after this, they celebrated the Mass at that spot. And it said that people walked away with joy. The people there uh, got to experience just a newness, if you will, of Christ and how he comes to them. It says, For the man saw a little child lying lifeless in the manger, and he saw the holy man of God, Francis, approach the child and waken him from a deep sleep. Nor is this vision unfitting, since in the hearts of many, the child Jesus has been given over to oblivion. Now he is awakened and impressed on their loving memory by his own grace through his holy servant Francis. At length, the night's solemnity draw to a close, and everyone went home with joy. The joy that was impressed upon them wasn't necessarily this joy that Francis um, conjured up by this, this representation, but more so the joy of Christ, the joy that Christ has come once again into this state of poverty so that way he can inform my own state of poverty, so that way he can just be with me in my own place where I am lacking. And people got to experience the joy of, of Christ, the, the child, with them in this time. And once again, um, it's, it's just a joy and opportunity. It's a joy and a gift to have the opportunity to, to minister to, to God's little ones in this way. Um, and so maybe about six years ago, I was, I was at <clears throat> our shelter Christmas party. And, um, and it was beautiful because, once again, we have an opportunity just to be with men uh, in this time where it could be difficult for them because they don't have family or friends around them. And I remember it's on the second floor of our homeless shelter, and there was a beautiful Christmas party put on. The eggnog was there and the Christmas cookies and the, the heat was going on and, um, and the Christmas tree was out. And just through generous benefactors, we had gifts for the men and simple things of 
socks, thermals, clothing, uh, just different things to help them on their journey uh, to make their, their journey a little bit easier. At the end of the night, um, one man was sitting there, Phil, in the corner as the men were going off to bed and all these men were just excited and happy. And then go over to Phil um, and Phil's just sitting there looking at all the different things that are at his feet. And I said, hey, Phil, are, are you okay? Um, and Phil, raising his eyes from looking down, he looks up at me and I see his face is wet with tears. I said, Phil, what's, what's going on? He says, this is, this is too much. It's all too much. And Phil proceeded to tell me that up to this point, maybe a couple days before, he'd just gotten out of prison and he was there for, uh, in prison for about 15 years or so. And so he then tells me, he says, I've never had a Christmas like this where I felt so loved and I can be a part of a family. And the beautiful thing is the next day, uh, Phil was, was at like the most joyful and the most childlike of any of the men in the shelter at that point. And it's beautiful because I think this, this articulation of Phil, like this is just too much, it's all too much, this place of being alone to this place of being um, together is once again the movement of the Eucharist and the movement of the heart of Francis where, yes, this gift of Jesus and his flesh and blood is too much. We don't deserve it, but it's not there that we sit as far as not being the ones who deserve it, but we freely receive this gift in the Eucharist. We freely receive, we, we freely receive the accompany of Christ in the places where we are most poor, in the places where it hurts, in the places where it's difficult. And for Phil and for Francis, um, it's a way forward once again. And finally, the crucifixion. For Francis, this may be the foremost area in which he saw the poverty of the Lord. And he endeavored to love Christ crucified um, until the, the, the very marks of Christ were imprinted on his hands and his feet. Um, the last two years of his life, he had the stigmata. And so um, he, was, he, he literally bore the marks of Jesus just throughout the final years of his life uh, because his heart was so conformed to Christ crucified. And it doesn't happen without this all being connected to the Eucharist, to Christ's flesh and blood, and also to for having a reverence of the, the infant Jesus. And the love of the Eucharist, I think once again, as I've been mentioning, connects us to our own poverty as we are met with, if you will, the poverty of Christ and how he humbly comes to us, how he is silent in the Eucharist. And for me, this is a place where, as our charism as friars of the renewal, and to for ourselves, that we can kind of move forward as St. Francis did. St. Francis beautifully saw himself as one who followed in the footsteps of Jesus, um, towards the Father in the Holy Spirit. Once again, he has this prayer which somewhat illumines his heart and shows us how it is that he thought of himself, but even more so, how we are to move forward. He says, Almighty and eternal, just and merciful God, give us miserable ones for your sake to do what which we know you want and always want that which pleases you, that interiorly cleansed, interiorly illumined, and inflamed by the fire of the Holy Spirit, we may follow the footsteps of your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and by your grace alone come to you, Most High, who lives and reigns in perfect trinity and simple unity and is glorified, God or powerful forever and ever. For Francis, this movement of prayer, illumined by the Holy Spirit, following in the footsteps of his son to the bosom of the Father, is a place which, which we can live, and even more so, live. And the truth is, if, if I am self-sufficient, if I am self-made, and if I have it all, there's no need for anyone outside of myself. In a word, there's no need for renewal. But if we recognize uh, our own poverty, our own lack, and our inability to oftentimes get to that place where we desire, or there be holiness or, or situations in our lives, then we become painfully aware of our need um, and our lack. And it's from that place that we can go to the Eucharist, to the poor one. It's interesting because Francis, once again, in his letter says, hold back nothing of yourselves for yourselves. And whenever we encounter our poverty, that place where, uh, once again, we don't have, it's from that place that we can freely be with the Lord and give him that lack. And whenever we encounter the poverty of someone else, it's also that place where we can freely give that person to the Eucharist and to, once again, Jesus' flesh and blood. 
John, once again, is this, this man who, during COVID, came in and, and prayed freely before the Blessed Sacrament. Um, he's one of the most free people I know. And honestly, it's, it's one of those things where you could look at him with worldly eyes and think that he doesn't have things, but he has enough, meaning a relationship with Jesus, where he has the freedom to, to speak freely and to, to ask him as a son for things. Um, an interaction I had with him recently, he came and rang the doorbell of our house and I sat with him for some time. And he asked, he says, hey, do you, do you know where you can get some Boston mackerel? I said, I'm guessing the fish store. He says, yep, there's one downtown on Fulton Street. You go there and ask for a Boston mackerel, but it has to be this, this, and this. I said, okay. He says, you're going to get the Boston mackerel, and you're going to come back, and you're going to make a clam chowder or a fish chowder. I said, okay, and I'm going to come back a week later, and you're going to give it to me. <laughs> <laughs> and he could pick up the hesitancy in my voice and in my, um, my saying yes to this, and he stopped me before I, I could even respond back. He said, brother, remember those who sow sparingly reap sparingly, and those who reap bountifully reap bountifully. So don't be cheap. (laughs) (laughs) And obviously you could tell me this because we have a relationship, but I think that that movement of his heart, um, as far as sowing sparingly and sowing bountifully, is true also with the Lord. Um, The Lord does not desire for us with him to be cheap. We can be stingy with what we hold on for ourselves, but if we freely give ourselves in a, in a movement of prayer in front of the Eucharist, knowing that in the silence we were met with a loving heart, a beating heart from the bosom of the Father that is there for us, specifically in our poverty, it's there that we can be accompanied in the struggle, be accompanied in the need, and know, as Francis did, that we are also poor ones. And that poverty doesn't necessarily mean the end of us, but it just grants us greater access to the heart of God. The Lord in the Eucharist stands before us as the heart of the Father for us. And that beating and loving heart is where we can find everything that we desire. And as Walter did, as Andres did, and as Phil did, um, we can begin by crying out and thanking God for his goodness by saying, Lord, this is too much for me to handle, but I'm here before you. Or finding a place Um, to be creative with him and just to sit and adoring him um, in the Eucharist by allowing him once again to be God and to be the one that informs every single thing that we do. Um, The Eucharist for Francis, once again, was this place where he knew that he can be before him as his poor one, so much so that he, with freedom, was able to sing, to be beat up by bandits and still praise God because he knew that his life wasn't about this world, but it was about the world to come. And much like that young man that said in the beginning of the live nativity, it's all about the money. For St. <laughs> for Saint Francis, it could have been about the money, but about the heavenly treasures, if you will. The heavenly treasures that awaited for him, specifically being a son of the Father, um, by freely giving up everything that he had so he can freely embrace everything that the Lord desired to give to him in prayer in the Eucharist. Um, and so as we... We give thanks to God for this this wonderful example of St. Francis. We give thanks also just for, once again, 800 years ago, for Francis being faithful to the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, for desiring to make incarnate, if you will, and to to reimagine and to bring to life the birth of Jesus. So that way, every time we approach a, a creche or a scene of the manger, we can remember that Christ's humility is with me, or Christ's poverty is a way in which I can experience his love, because it's truly in that place that we can experience his goodness, his love, and his care for us. And we know that we don't have to have it all figured out, but instead he has figured it out already by sending his son and by being with us in this place. Thank you. Father, can we ask you some questions? For sure. You know, I, I, I've got a lot of things going through my head, but um, I was inspired by the examples you gave, particularly Phil. Um, St. Francis was, before his conversion, a, a, a man of means. He was mm-hmm. a man of wealth. And, you know, obviously you as a spiritual son of Francis, um, 
as you entered into religious life, you had to renounce so many things as he did, and you, you dress simply, you live simply, and you've, you've renounced material things. And it's all obviously an imitation of what you described in the gospel story of Jesus mm -hmm. coming humbly to a stable to be born, the savior mm -hmm. of the world. How, can you give some advice or share some advice that, you know, for those of us that are um, preparing for the celebration of Christmas and trying to be um, inspired by this action of God to, to come in such a, a simple and such a, a humble way, um, how can we at least, if not going to the extent of a, a Franciscan friar, uh, mm -hmm. at least in a, in a spiritual sense, live uh, more simply in our um, observance of Christmas? Sure. That's a great question. Um, I'm big on like just to be who you are as far as your state in life, because Nobody here is called to be a Franciscan friar. Uh, we all have family and, and, and different states in life, but I think we all have something that we can, if you will, offer to the Christ child on the day of Christmas. Um, and there's simple things, if it's, if it's time or if it's uh, a particular relationship or if it's, if it's something that, once again, that you're, you're holding on to. But, um, but creatively creating a space, uh, first of all, for prayer, maybe taking some time intentionally as, as the days come up to Christmas, because as we know, the season gets busy with, with gifts and different things and going to see this person, that person, but, um, but creating a space just to once again, hear the Lord speak to you in the, in the moment and the time, specifically on the, on the days upcoming to Christmas and Advent in particular, but also to just offering the Christ child something that, that you've held on to. Um, if it's a relationship or if it's, um, once again, like my own time or if it's a specific dream or a specific thing, just to give that freely to him because that's what he desires more than anything else. Um, because we can quickly run to, to money or to other things, but I think those things are easily disposable sometimes where the things that we hold on to that are dearest to us, we don't want to give up because it's difficult. Um, but Christ will meet us in that place because he desires to not just take those things from us, but to be with us in that place. Thank you, Father. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have a question that they'd like to pose to Father? Did St. Francis have the stigmata most of his time as a Franciscan, or at what point did he get yeah. it? Yeah. Last, the last two years of his life. Um, and so the stigmata of Francis was unique. I mean, the stigmata is unique altogether. but he actually had the nails in his hands and his feet. And so, um, and it was rather, it's rather painful. Um, as we know, different saints like Padre Pio had it for about 50 or so years, but uh, Francis only had it for the past or last two years of his life. And so, um, and he, he tried to hide it as much as he can because he was embarrassed uh, about it uh, because of his humility and not wanting to, to show this gift, if you will, that the Lord has given him uh, from his brothers. And so, um, only a few members of the community actually knew about it. And um, it wasn't until the end of his life that this became more understood and popularized. And so, um, but the last two years of his life is when he had the stigmata. Other questions, sir? Thank you for coming from New York, You're where welcome. I was born. Nice. <laughs> Long Island, especially. Nice. Um, I've just begun the study of St. Dominic, mm -hmm. and that whole era, the two prominent people in that area are St. Francis and St. Dominic, and my study has just begun. So I wonder, are you aware of the influence between the two, if there was any, hmm. and any, uh, any changes that came to St. Francis because of a, a potential relationship with St. Dominic? All right. This would be a better question for Father Jonathan Kolish, <laughs> or my Dominican brother. Um, I do know, I, I forgot which council, but it's reported that they, they probably went together to um, a specific council. Um, but the, the unique thing about both Franciscans and Dominicans was that they, the, the model for religious life was Benedictine at that point. Um, and so they kind of changed things by being itinerant preachers and by going out and yeah, and just doing things in a, in a different way. And so I'd, I'd like to imagine, I do think, I don't know specifically between Francis and Dominic, but the two orders, 
they did kind of influence each other in the way in which they did things. And uh, still to this day, the Franciscans, we celebrate St. Dominic as a feast day and they celebrate St. Francis as a feast day. Um, and the tradition for us is that on the Feast of St. Francis, we would have a Dominican come and preach. On the Feast of St. Dominic, a Franciscan comes and preach. Um, and so there is a, a close knit connection between the two. And I'm sure just throughout just the natural growing up, because Italy's a small place at this point, um, that they, they did influence each other. And so you. you're welcome. Other questions? Uh, regarding the, the living crash and the depiction of the, of the major scene, did that quickly catch on right away? Like, it was, the fo it was it repeated the following year and the year after that, and then it spread? Is that what happened? Yeah. That, from my understanding is every year they would do this at Greccio, and then slowly but surely it started to spread throughout the different places. And so, um, because at this point in Greccio there was a friary, um, and so the friars would memorialize it and do it the same way. And so, yeah. Other questions? Father Pierre Toussaint, it's been a joy to have you. Thank you mm -hmm. so much for helping us to prepare for the Christmas season and to uh, appreciate the example that Francis gave us 800 mm -hmm. years ago um, that we perpetuate to this day. Mm -hmm. and so each time you see uh, a nativity scene, whether it's in a church or whether it's in your home uh, or even uh, hopefully on a, on a city green, that you can think of St. Francis and right. his example, his appreciation for the Christ child, the simplicity, the humility mm -hmm. that he showed in, in coming among us. Um, so I'll, I'll give another commercial for our Christmas show, which has just opened. I invite you, those of you who are here, to enjoy it. And those of you who are watching, if you have the occasion, please visit us throughout the Christmas season so that you can enjoy this show. And one of the elements of the show is particularly featuring uh, this historical account of St. Francis establishing the creche at Greccio. Um, let's continue to pray for the Holy Land, obviously. Um, the Franciscans, uh, not CFRs, but, but other Franciscans have custody of so many of these holy sites mm -hmm. in, um, in Jerusalem, and we know that there's a great deal of, uh, of tension, anxiety, fighting, and um, let's pray that the Prince of Peace brings peace to that land very mm -hmm. soon. Um, as is the custom here at the McGivney Center, we've prepared a little reception for those of you in attendance and an opportunity to uh, continue to visit with our speaker, Father Pierre Toussaint, for a few minutes. So thank you so much for coming. God bless you. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Father, please, before you go, make sure that you...